We Christians can be a strange bunch. We like to use language that seems a little bit opaque to people who aren't from our people. So if Christians start using words like sanctification or speaking in tongues, people from outside the church might just scratch their head and go, I have no idea what they're talking about. Sometimes we Christians tend to look a little bit different than other people. It could be t-shirts with Bible verses on it, or it could be some of those people that always appear a little bit overdressed for the places that they are. I remember once Carolyn and I had to head out after church and get somewhere quickly, so we just popped by Burger King. The restaurant was deserted until a family came in behind us, and they seemed kind of overdressed to be there. Father was wearing a tie and some slacks and a button-down shirt, and his kids looked immaculately dressed, including his, his daughters in dresses. But two of his sons were starting to misbehave. Oh, sorry. Before I, I said to Carol, and I said, what do you bet they just came from church? And then the two of his sons started to misbehave, and he says, Levi, Asher, stop it. I was like, oh, yeah, they definitely just came from church. So, yeah, Christians look different. Now, Christians are supposed to be different, but the difference isn't necessarily supposed to be those external differences, like our language and the way that we look, but rather there's supposed to be a foundational difference in Christians. Because Christians are supposed to be following God, who's directing our lives towards a different end than the, the communities of this world are directed towards. We are meant to embody God's holiness to the world. God says, be holy because I am holy. Now, holiness is not supposed to be judgmentalism. We're not supposed to wag our fingers at every person who does something that we disagree with. Rather, holiness is about being set apart for God and his purposes to follow his will. God's purposes are to establish a community of mutual love, of belonging, of justice, and of flourishing. And as good as this is, this is not the same end to which most other people devote their lives. Our community tells us, our culture tells us, that the greatest good is the maximization of personal freedom, and also that we can succeed as individuals. And so because the people around us are pursuing a different set of goals, they take a different way of getting there. But because those goals seem to them to be self-evident, when we are going in a different direction, when everybody should be going this way, we are easily misunderstood. And we see that God calls us in a different direction. He calls his people in that way because he's concerned about the kind of community that we are becoming. We see this in a very practical way with regard to Old Testament property laws. I know, the most exciting thing in the world, right? <laughs> but um, in the Old Testament, the time uh, when this was happening, the economy was, was land-based. And so the way that a person became powerful was receiving lots of land. Um, so God limits the way that people can acquire land. See, when land is the center of an economy, there are going to be people who try to consolidate land. When they consolidate land, it turns those people into an elite class. And when you have an elite class, you have a power imbalance. You have those with land and power and those without. And when you have that power imbalance, you always seem to have exploitation. The powerful making sure that the interests serve them and not the interests of the people who are poor. And because God wants to create a community of justice and belonging and flourishing, he limits the power of people to accumulate too much in the way of land. Within the law, there's a provision for something called the year of jubilee. Every 50 years, debts are canceled, slaves are freed, and all land is meant to revert to its original owner. So there can be no development of a landed aristocracy in a society that observes the law of Jubilee. So let's look at this law of Jubilee in Leviticus chapter 25, starting in verse 14. If you sell land to any of your own people or buy it from them, do not take advantage of each other. You are to buy from your own people, your own tribe, 
on the basis of the number of years since the Jubilee, and they are to sell to you on the basis of the number of years left for harvesting crops. When the years are many, you are to increase the price, and when the years are few, you are to decrease the price, because what you're really selling uh, is the number of crops. Do not take advantage of each other, but fear your God. I am the Lord your God. The land must not be sold permanently, because the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. So essentially, you could lease your land to someone for a long term, up to 50 years, depending on how long it's been since the last year of Jubilee, but you're not allowed to permanently sell that land to anybody because the land belongs to God and he hasn't authorized the permanent sale. So this is the law, but there's no evidence, either from the biblical narrative or the archaeological record, that this was ever carried out. People instead did what seemed right in their own eyes. So God regulates property rights in a way that seems very peculiar in the ancient Near Eastern context. And he's ignored by those who seek to benefit from ignoring the rules. This morning we're looking at Ahab. We're, of course, doing a series on different kings of Israel and Judah. And I want to look at the intersection between Ahab and these property rules. Ahab is widely regarded by most people as Israel's worst king, and his wife Jezebel looks even worse in the narrative. Ahab is from the tribe of Manasseh, and he has a capital city established by his father, Omri, in Samaria. But Samaria is in Manasseh's tribal allotment. When the, when the Israelites conquered the land of Canaan, they were instructed to basically divvy it up into 12 parts, and one part for each of the 12 tribes was allotted to them. And so he's supposed to live in Manasseh because that's where he's allowed to own land. But he also has a second residence, a palace, in the town of Jezreel. But Jezreel is not in the territory of Manasseh. Instead, Jezreel is in the territory of Issachar. But he tries to uh, acquire some more territory in the place of Issachar. And this is where he runs into trouble. He sees a neighboring vineyard belonging to a man named Naboth. And he says, you know, I'd really like to have that vineyard. I'm guessing maybe it's right next door. It abuts his property. And he has different properties all over. So he'd rather exchange one that's over here uh, in order to get one that's, that you know, creates one whole packet of land. And so we read this in 1 Kings chapter 21, 1-3. Some time later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use as a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab seems to make a reasonable request, we might assume, and he is rebuffed. He doesn't understand, and perhaps we don't understand why. Ahab's thinking about property, of course, comes from his cultural context. In the ancient Near East, as today, the assumption is that if you own property, it is yours to dispose of as you please. And so selling that property, if you feel you're going to get something better for it, is a win-win. Why wouldn't Naboth agree to do that? Well, Naboth's assumptions about land ownership don't come from the surrounding culture. Instead, he's trying to be faithful to the Torah. Ahab isn't from the tribe of Issachar, so he's not meant to sell his land to him. And Ahab's not offering a you know, temporary thing until the next year of Jubilee. Rather, he's asking for a perpetual purchase of the land. Naboth feels that he would be being unlawful to deprive his descendants of what is rightfully theirs. He's not authorized to permanently sell the land, so he refuses. Now Ahab misunderstands because in Ahab's mind, it is self-evident that land 
can be sold by whomever owns it. And so he interprets Naboth's unwillingness to sell the land as disloyalty. He goes home, irked and offended, and his wife Jezebel sees it and says, don't worry about it, honey, I'll take care of it. And she goes and orchestrates the framing of Naboth for treason and has him executed, and Ahab then seizes the vineyard. He gets what he wants without having to pay for it. But this is a very serious offense, and God sends the prophet Elijah to Ahab to denounce him for this, saying that his family line is going to be wiped out because he treated Naboth, who was righteous, in such a terrible way. So how do we apply this lesson? Well, I guess it goes without saying that if you find yourself in a place of having the power of life over, and death over people, you shouldn't put them to death because they don't sell you land. I suspect that none of us will ever be in that situation. So if we want to apply this text, I think we're going to need to be a little more imaginative. We might ask ourselves if we should try to make sure that the laws about the year of Jubilee are established in our time and place. I don't think that is a good idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, this law is peculiar to Israel. Israel is not just a, the people of God. They are also a political entity, and they receive their law from God. We live in a pluralistic context, and so it's a bit different. And on top of that, we don't live in a culture where the economy is determined by land ownership. Wealth and power are more derived from capital rather than from land use. So the rationale for those rules doesn't really exist in our context the way that it does. So that's not really a helpful application. But I think if we take a step back, the big picture that I see is that Naboth is trying to live a different kind of life that's devoted to the direction that God has given him instead of living a life that is directed in the ways that the culture says a life ought to be directed. And we have that same sort of calling. Like Naboth, we have been given a challenge by God to live towards a different end for our lives. By end, I don't mean like the finish of our life. I mean the purpose of our life. So our lives are dedicated to a different end rather than the end that the, the world does, that the end that the world does feels self-evident to the world. And so like Naboth, we are likely to be misunderstood because we are obedient to God. Now, when Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount, he laid out ways in which the conventional wisdom among pious Jews was not consistent with God's ethic for his kingdom, the kind of community that he was building. And so he, he said this series of six things called the antitheses. And by that, we, they're the places where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. So these antitheses are helpful for us to understand the ways in which our calling as Jesus' people are at odds with the sort of conventional wisdom that is around us. These are the ways that our lives will be different if we are true to the calling than our lives would be if we were following the ideas of this world. So the first of these has to do with reconciliation. Jesus says it's not enough to just not kill the person who has done something wrong to you, but rather we must proactively reconcile with others. In Matthew 5, starting in verse 21, he says this, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to the judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is an Aramaic word of contempt, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. So the world says that we have no obligation to reconcile with people 
when we are estranged from them. But Jesus tells us that God won't even listen to us unless we are reconciling with people. Jesus says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now this advice is especially relevant in an age where Christians more than any other people are identified with grievance politics. There are so many Christians who believe that our holy duty is to nurse a grudge against this or that group because they don't conform to our vision of who the world should be. But God wants us to be a community of flourishing. And unresolved conflicts simply fester and bubble over in terrible unpleasantness. And so God is not allowing us to hold on to grudges. If we are true to the calling of Christ, then we must nip conflict in the bud, resolve those things as quickly as possible, because the community that God is calling into existence can only exist when we are at peace with one another. In a sort of related area, Jesus talks about revenge. Our world thinks it's okay to stand up for yourself, to get back, in, at least within certain limitations, at people who've hurt us, and it certainly is okay to return hostility for hostility. But Jesus tells us something different. He says, you've heard that it was said, for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Getting even, or at least nursing a grudge, is a somewhat intoxicating feeling. When someone has wronged me, I can make myself feel like the righteous person who has been wronged, and they are the godless person who has done this terrible thing to me. I feel like I'm better than they are, and there's something that makes me feel just warm and cuddly inside when I'm better than somebody. <sighs> but if I live that way, it poisons me. God doesn't want us to live content with holding others in contempt. Rather, we need to allow others not to be the object of our contempt, but to be objects of our love. Political populism, both on the left and on the right, tries to feed grievance. It says that life isn't fair, and they, it always identifies as they, are to blame for it. But Jesus tells us that we can't hold on to those grudges. We just have to let it go. God loves all people, and if we are going to be his representatives, then we must also be free to love all people. And so harboring resentments is incompatible with this calling and incompatible with the community that God wants to create among his people. God's call is very different with regard to the way that we deal with our spouses, the people with whom we make um, commitments. I remember once when I was in high school, I was uh, hanging out with a friend of mine, and we had gone to McDonald's. And this friend of mine, he's not a Christian. He had a girlfriend at the time. And he saw another girl that was very attractive, and he was making some lewd comments about her. And I just said, you know, you've got a girlfriend. And he says, just because I'm on a diet doesn't mean I can't look at the menu. And that's the attitude that many people in our community and our, our culture have about wandering eyes. It's perfectly okay. It doesn't cause anybody harm. I can just look and there's be no problem, but Jesus doesn't say it's tr that's true. Likewise, we see people who make commitments to one another in marriage. They say that, I will forsake all others till death do we part. But they don't really mean that. They mean, I'm committed to you as long as it's working for me. But for many people, it doesn't continue to work for them, and so they end up divorcing their spouse. But Jesus calls us to radical covenantal commitments. We're supposed to honor those commitments that we make to one another, to our spouses, even when it's not working for us at any point in time. 
Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Our culture says that we should do whatever makes us happy. You can't help who you fall in love with. So, you know, all's fair in love and war. But of course, we make a decision to honor the vows that we have made or not. And when we choose not to honor those vows, well, even if we are happy about it, the other person almost certainly is not. Nobody wants to be rejected. And on top of that, there's so much more heartache when there are children involved. Our community is full of families that have been broken by the unwillingness of people to honor the commitments they have made. And it's especially the children who face lifelong consequences of that abandonment. If we want to be the kind of place where everyone flourishes, then we have to be the kind of place where we consider how our actions affect the other people around us, especially those to whom we have entered into a covenant of exclusive faithfulness. And so if you want to be a member of this community, God calls us to be faithful to our spouses. The final of these antitheses that I want to look at has to do with honesty. In Jesus' day, people felt like if they had made a promise that they had to abide by that. So long as that promise didn't have loopholes built in, there was lots of vows that a person could say that they would say, oh, in the end, that one's not actually binding. In our own day and age, people are less concerned about what they promise. You know, they, of course, if you promise your kid you're going to do something, you should try to do that thing. But Jesus tells us that even if our goal is to say, no, you need to keep your promise when you've made your word, Jesus is telling us that we should regard everything that we say we will do as a, a solemn oath. Jesus says, again, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So God is basically saying that our integrity should be so unimpeachable that I need only to say yes or no. No one will require me to promise anything because they know that I'm dependable. If we are to build a community of mutual flourishing, the kingdom of God, then we are to we need to have trust. And trust can only happen when we can depend on one another. And so living in a kind of place where people are going to try and game the system and and keep as few of the promises as as possible and try and weasel out of the commitments that they have made, then God's kingdom does not take root in such a community. We need to be exemplars of truthfulness. So to kind of wrap all this up in a bow, we've talked about Old Testament property rights, and now we're talking about Jesus. How do, what's the through line? How do we, do we make sense of all this? Well, Ahab had a set of assumptions about property that was based in the culture around him. And Naboth had a set of of assumptions about property that was based on God's instructions. And those two things weren't the same. Ahab thought that his way was the way that everybody was thinking, and so Naboth's intransigence was mystifying to him. Like Naboth, we too have a calling to live life towards a different set of purposes than the world typically does. And so our actions, just like Naboth's actions, will seem equally as inexplicable to other people who don't share our assumptions. God, however, has invited us into the honor of previewing his wisdom right here and right now, that he wants us to live together in such a way that it demonstrates what a community of people 
who live according to God's will looks like. If we do that, we may find that we experience the kind of life we've always wanted, but we may also find that we are misunderstood. So my advice to all of us is let us live the kind of life that God has called. And if that makes us look weird, let's be weird. <laughs>